I want to welcome you today to this episode of Traffic Talk. I'm very excited, and I know that you are too, uh, that we are joined today by Brother Michael Enzi, uh, General Youth President of the United Pentecostal Church International. Thank you so much for joining me, bro. Thank you, Matt. It's been a great trip to New Brunswick. I love coming here and looking forward to this time with you. I've watched all of your Traffic Talk videos. Really? Love them. I have. Thank you very much. That means a lot. We'll jump into some questions here, and uh, I guess the first question I want to ask you is about your responsibilities as the General Youth President. What does a typical day look like in the life of Michael Enzi? A typical day uh, will begin uh, with some devotion, and right now we have Devote 365, the daily devotional of the General Youth Division and I'm working through that devotion with my 11-year-old son, Lincoln, and so I love starting my day, uh, spending that time with him, doing some devotion, and show up in the office around 9 a.m., and typically my day will start off with just kind of processing email, going through mm-hmm. some, some email that uh, is pressing. I'll go through that. Then I'll begin working through various projects, uh, my my daily and monthly task list as youth president. Uh, we are always in a state of planning, of working on a variety of events and programs and different ministry projects. And so I'll begin to work through those, uh, beginning with the highest priorities. We have a lot of meetings uh, with our GYD executive team, uh, with other ministries in the building. So that's a a typical day there in the office, and I'll be in the office three to four days a week, uh, depending on the travel schedule. I do travel probably three weekends out of the month. Mm -hmm. I'll travel for ministry. A lot of those are uh, youth weekends at a local church or a youth convention or district conferences where we're participating and representing the general youth division. Right. So uh, in regards to your team, the next question I want to ask you, are there any interesting ways or things that you guys do to stay motivated, focused, uh, and unified? Kind of like maybe getting away, doing something for more fun. Anything you guys do like that? As far as our team, we have staff meeting every other week. Okay. And that seems to work for us because of our travel schedules, the time that we spend in the office. So we'll have a, a staff meeting, the entire team getting together. We always start that off with a devotion, a time of prayer. Uh, for me, that's one of the most important things that we do in our staff meeting. Uh, here recently, we had a staff meeting that uh, turned into an hour-long prayer meeting. Awesome. And we finished, and we hadn't moved beyond that number one agenda item of devotion and prayer. And we had probably 10 other items we thought we needed to get to that day. But we just set that aside and had that time of prayer. And those staff meetings really uh, bring our team together, helps us to stay focused on what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, Our executive team, we try at least once a week for the three members of our executive team to get together and have an executive staff meeting. And that keeps us connected with what the others are are working on, keeps us all on the same page. It it also keeps us from kind of just always popping into each other's offices at random times. And I've got a question, hey, what about this? We try to save those questions and some of that work for that executive meeting sure. where we can work through all those things and be a little bit more efficient with our time. We also try to take some time with our staff where we will uh, go out for a breakfast or go out for a lunch probably about once a month where we're going to get out of the office, okay. take our team, just have some good fellowship with the team. Uh, and then throughout the year, uh, we will also... Uh, take all of our staff out for their birthdays. That's another time where we were celebrating our staff members cool. and take them out to lunch. Uh, we'll also have a staff retreat, and we typically will do that once a year. Where we'll take our staff away for a couple of days and spend time with them. It's not a work-related retreat. It's just a time to take a break, to chill. have some fellowship. We're going to chill, hang out with each other, and it's a good good bonding time for our team. I want to I move on to... Um to Youth Congress. In one of the planning cycles for a Youth Congress, what is something that you absolutely love about it? And what is something that you dread most about the planning? Or, or the event itself? Well, the opportunity to be a part of something like North American Youth Congress is 
absolutely incredible. I love details. I'm a very detail-oriented person. Uh, can can tend to be a little bit of a perfectionist. I love digging into the details, and so planning an event like this uh, is something that I, I love the opportunity to be a part of. It is a lengthy planning cycle. We are planning four to six years out when it comes to the That's locations insane. of North American Youth Congress. <laughs> so we, while we're working on 2017 right now, we've already contracted for 2019 and we've contracted for 2021. I'm sure everybody would love to know what those locations are. Well, you told me you were gonna say, right? I, I'm not gonna be able to disclose that while the camera's <laughs> running. So I might can tell you that after the camera shut off. Okay, <laughs> I, I won't tell. I even have a contract on my desk right now for 2023 Youth Congress, but we're probably gonna hold off a little while before we sign that contract. That's so amazing. this planning process is pretty intense and we typically will be contracted three to four years out for each Youth Congress. So I love that part of the planning, that aspect of it. Uh, as far as things that I, I don't enjoy, I would say on some level the, the intensity of the pressure uh, dealing with an event of that magnitude, it can be pretty overwhelming at times. Mm -hmm. And so that, that part of it isn't always enjoyable. But we have an amazing team from our GYD team to literally hundreds of volunteers that help make Youth Congress possible and lighten that load for us and enable us, a staff of 10 people, mm -hmm. to be able to put on an event of that magnitude it's incredible. requires a whole lot of volunteers to, to make that possible. No question. So you kind of you already mentioned briefly Lucas Oil Stadium, and I want to bring this up because obviously you guys are making the decision to make a jump from an arena to a stadium. Did I say that right? Yes. yes an arena to a stadium. So at what point, because it's such a long planning cycle, at, one, at what point did you say, man, we gotta we gotta bump this up to a seventy thousand seat uh, facility? Well, it was 2 o'clock in the morning on March 1st, 2015, when we realized that we needed to make that move for 2017. Wow. The reason that it was 2 o'clock in the morning, I didn't have a vision. An angel <laughs> didn't show up in my room and uh, say, it is time to move to a stadium. It wasn't quite that dramatic, but it was pretty intense because March 1st, 2015 is when we opened registration for Youth Congress 2015. Right. Right. And we opened registration with 18,000 tickets available and literally within about 10 seconds, the first 4,000 tickets for level one sold out. Within four to five minutes, the next 6,000 tickets for level two sold out. and. A couple of hours into this process, about two o'clock in the morning, as level three tickets were beginning to sell quickly, our GYD team, we were in different places around the country that night, but we're talking, we're texting, our minds are blown that tickets are selling so fast. We had an idea that maybe it might sell out, mm -hmm. but we're thinking weeks or months down the road, not right. hours. And we realized this thing is about to sell out. And so we had already started the process of working on 2019 Youth Congress. Uh, we had been contracted at that point for two years on 2017. We had contracted with Columbus, Ohio for Youth Congress to be there in 2017. And sorry, we had, sorry, Columbus. <laughs> yes, we apologize, Columbus, <laughs> that uh, you, you lost out on this opportunity. So <clears throat> I had already started that process in 2019 and had mentioned to Connections Housing, that's the company that manages all of our hotel room blocks. They manage our negotiations with cities and with facilities, the convention centers and arenas. Yep. Uh, they manage that whole contracting process for us. And so I had already told them for 2019, I want you to look at some domed stadiums as a possibility for Youth Congress. So two o'clock in the morning, March 1st, 2015, I sent an email to Connections Housing and I said, number one, I need you to find out what's it gonna take for us to get out of our contract with Columbus and all those cities that you're talking to about domes for 2019, I want you to ask them about the dates for 2017. Okay. And that started the process where 
we knew we had to do something quickly if we're going to get this done. And it started a process where over the course of about two months, we were able to locate the Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, Indiana. They had one week available. And it was the only domed stadium with any availability around that time in all of North America. There were wow. no other options. Wow. It was Lucas Oil Stadium the last week of July. And so that was it. And we felt like it was the will of God at that time to make that move because of the momentum and the growth of Youth Congress. And at that time, we didn't even know what was going to happen at Youth Congress 2015. Sure, we yeah. didn't realize how impacting it was going to be. We had an idea. We knew it was going to be a sellout crowd. But at that point, we had no idea the incredible unprecedented demonstration of the Holy Ghost that we were about to experience. Mm -hmm. But we knew that there was momentum. We knew that God was doing something, that He was up to something. And we didn't want the size of the arena to hinder the growth and stop the momentum of right. Youth Congress. Right. It was heartbreaking. The phone calls and the emails we received from people who were begging and pleading for tickets to Youth Congress who couldn't make it because it was sold out. I mean, it, it was gut-wrenching for us to, I mean, there were, uh, there were tears that were shed as people were asking, you know, my young people want to be there, they want to be a part of this. And so that was so exciting for us to be able to make Lucas Oil Stadium available in 2017, to move into that dome stadium with 68,000 fixed seats. There'll be five or 6,000 people on the floor. So over 70,000 seats that'll be available in that dome. I don't know how many we're gonna have, but I know it's gonna be a lot. That's and awesome. we've got a great vision for what's gonna happen in 2017. I really believe that there is prophetic significance mm -hmm. to this event, that it, it is more than just a gathering. It's more than just an exciting event that it really does tie into this movement in this current generation, the hunger and passion for God, for the things of God, to be involved in the work of God, that it, it's a part of God's plan for what He's doing in this generation and for the revival that's happening in North America. But I believe that, that God has more for us and there's greater revival to come in, our, uh, in, in the United States and Canada. Do you have any cool SFC stories, people that have gotten in touch with you, missionaries uh, that have been blessed by the funds. Like, What's one of the coolest stories that you've ever heard of OSFC? Well, one of the most amazing, inspiring stories we heard in recent years was from former missionary Brother Daniel Scott. Okay. I don't know if you happen to see the video we created. Uh, we titled it Creating Roads from Brother Daniel Scott, who was a former youth president of, I believe it was the East Central District involved like seven states. This okay. was back in the 60s. Okay, yeah. And he was a youth president there and then God called him to be a missionary to Ecuador. And he goes to Ecuador and there was a group of Indians called the Colorado Indians that there was no way to get to them. No one had ever been able to take the gospel to them. No missionary organization, group of any kind, any denomination had ever been able to get to them. But Brother Scott had a vision and a burden to reach the Colorado Indians with the gospel. And so he took his SFC vehicle and a pickaxe and some tools and some other men and they created a road wow. to make it back into the bush, into the jungle, to make it to where these Indians were to take the gospel to them. And today, there's a church there, and that road is now a highway in Ecuador wow. that Brother Scott created with his SFC vehicle and a group of men that were passionate to get the gospel to those Indians. It cool. just, just one of the most amazing stories in the use of a, an SFC vehicle. A highlight of my year, every year, is the opportunity to chaperone one of our Apostolic Youth Corps trips. And this summer, we'll chaperone our 10th trip one neat aspect of those trips is the opportunity to ride in Chiefs for Christ vehicles when oh, we're okay. with those missionaries. And when I have the opportunity to sit down in an SFC vehicle 
and the missionary with tears in his eyes is saying thank you to you, to the youth division, to the students of North America for sacrificially giving to the cause of SFC so that I can have this vehicle. That's awesome. That's a special moment. Absolutely. It's really cool to be able to make that personal connection to sit in that vehicle that's been purchased by Sheaves for Christ Funds. That's so cool. And they're purchased, this random question, they purchased over there or do you ship them over? They purchased them overseas for, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, it is very expensive. It takes a lot of funds to purchase vehicles. A lot of times they're imported into those countries from somewhere, from somewhere else. And so uh, vehicles are very expensive to purchase in most of our uh, countries where our missionaries are. And Sheeps for Christ is the only means through which our missionaries can purchase vehicles. Wow. They are not able to personally raise funds for vehicles. They cannot take their, their budget from their partners and missions that they receive. They can't take that budget and purchase a vehicle. They have to purchase their vehicle with the use of Sheaves for Christ funds. And so uh, there's great urgency and a great need for raising SFC funds so that our missionaries have the vehicles that they need in their local country. I love asking this question. Share one of the funniest or strangest church service moments, ministry experiences, whatever, whenever, but funniest or strangest? Well, this story might fall into both categories, Fair possibly. Uh, just within the last year or two, I was preaching in a church somewhere between the North and South Pole. Okay. And uh, while I'm preaching, I'm coming to the conclusion of my message, and I had everyone standing. And the back wall of the sanctuary was glass. And so I could see into the foyer or the foyer, I think, as you say it here in Canada. We kind of flip-flop back so, and forth. <laughs> so I could see into the foyer and see what's happening there. And I saw a little boy get up from one of the chairs and make his way down the center aisle and walk out into the foyer. And he's standing out there when all of a sudden there was quite a commotion. And a couple of people from the sanctuary made their way out. Thankfully, the crowds are looking at me, and they aren't too distracted, but I'm very distracted as I'm trying to go into the altar service about what is happening out here in the foyer, and I could tell something very wrong was going on. Thankfully, I didn't find out until after the altar service what was happening because I probably wouldn't have made it through the altar service. But apparently, a young boy, five or six years old, was sleeping on the pew, and he started sleepwalking, and he walked out into the foyer, and he thought he was in the restroom, but he wasn't. He was in the middle of the foyer. And so he began to use the restroom right there in the middle of the foyer. And a lady was coming out of the woman's restroom and saw him there. And thus the commotion that began to take place in the foyer insane. there. So that, that would be one of the crazier things that's happened while I was preaching. Wow. Who cleaned up the mess? That's what I want to know. I don't know. Did he, did he wake up in time to clean it up himself? I think he woke up at some point when people were screaming, were screaming. at him. What are you Wait, doing? Wait! Stop! <laughs> oh, my goodness. What is your sermon prep process? And, and you don't need to... We don't. We only have a couple minutes here, but um, what, what, what regimen do you have for preparing a sermon? I would say, first of all, that I don't have just... A very specific process that I go through with every message. Okay. I I keep a list of sermon ideas. Got it on my phone. I use Evernote, the okay, app yeah. Evernote, and so I have a a list that I just keep there of sermon ideas, sermon starters, things that I will perhaps think of while I'm listening to another message, right? Or while I'm just reading scripture. And so I'll put it into that list, and that becomes the genesis for a majority of my sermons. And I'll begin to work on some of those ideas and develop them. And that process of developing, for me, most of the time, I'm going to start with a single thought. A lot of times it may be my title, and I'll begin with that single thought, and then I will begin to build that message and very much a process of kind of working from my uh, initial concept mm -hmm. 
what I'm trying to communicate, the big idea of the message, almost like a, a lawyer in building my case. So then I'm going to begin to take those points. I'm very much a two, three, or four point preacher. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have a couple of points that are going to support that big idea idea. of the message and so I'll begin to work on developing those those concepts Uh, if I don't have a story or something kind of the interesting hook for the beginning of the message I'll I'll work on that trying to develop something that's going to gain the interest of the crowd that's going to be that opening Mm -hmm. story that's going to catch their attention and then add in the scripture that's going to support Right. That big idea and that concept that I'm trying to communicate, and then, and then build the closing, and the action. That would be the way the majority of of messages are created. Um, my message at North American Youth Congress 2015 yeah. was one of the most unique messages for me as far as the development of it, because it really was kind of developed from the end to the beginning. Mm-hmm. I was at because of the times in 2014. And Brother Terry Schock had preached in a morning session, and we concluded that service uh, with communion. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that in that altar service, I felt like God spoke to me and said, you're going to conclude your message at Youth Congress in 2015 with communion. And I'm in my mind thinking, how in the world am I going to get to communion? What kind of message am I going to preach that it's going to fit and there's going to be a flow to go into communion at the end of that message. But God developed that message from the end of that and it began to build to the the beginning of the message. It was very unique for me. In fact, I didn't have the title for the message until about two weeks before Youth Congress. Really? And so it was a very interesting process in building that sermon, which it was about a year and a half of, of preparation. And I felt like the the setting demanded that yeah. uh, kind of preparation. I guess when you have a message. year and a half to prepare for a sermon, you're like, this better be good. <laughs> it better be. <laughs> it better be. Thank you so much, bro. God bless you, Matt. Thank you for watching, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.